Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Explorer Classroom. My name is Joe Grabowski from National Geographic, and I will be your host for today. Really excited for today's Hangout. But before we meet uh, our speaker, Peter, today, I'm going to take a quick moment, and we're going to jump into National Geographic's Mac Mapmaker Interactive, and we're going to take a look at where some of the classrooms are joining us live from today. So just give me a second to share my screen. There we go. All right. We are on the map. So this is me at the Red X. I am in Alora, Ontario, just uh, here outside of Toronto in Canada. If we start to back up a little bit, we can get a feel for some more of our classrooms. We've got another classroom in Bradford, Ontario, another joining us in London, Ontario. And if we back up and head across the border, we've got a classroom hanging out with us in Michigan today, classrooms in New Jersey and Delaware. And if we back up one more, you can see we have a classroom joining us in Florida as well as in Kansas today. And then Peter is joining us from, and Peter, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you're joining us in Columbia today? I am in, yep, I am in Bogota. Perfect, so I even put the X in the right spot. Awesome, go. good start. All right, so I'm gonna stop my screen share, and I just wanna give a quick shout out to any classrooms who are joining us uh, live via YouTube. You can still get in on the action. There's a chat sidebar on the right. Use that to send in questions. Let us know where you're viewing from and we'll work some of those in. And then of course, if, whether you're on camera or on YouTube, um, take some pictures, share them on Twitter with the hashtag Explorer Classroom. And of course, tag uh, Nat Geo, Geo Education. We love to see classrooms in action. So this month, our theme is uh, trees and forests. So we'll be looking at issues surrounding our trees and forests around the world all month long. And we have Peter Houlihan joining us today. He's a multilingual tropical conservation scientist and photographer. In the past 15 years, he's led more than 35 expeditions in some of the world's least studied rainforests across four continents and more than 20 countries for conservation. He's passionate about engaging and working with communities where he works, sharing the results of the science that he does, and inspiring others to care and learn about our planet. So through photos and videos, he's sharing the science behind important issues related to our planet with audiences around the world. So Peter, it's so awesome to have you joining us today, kicking off our first Explorer Classroom of the Month. We're excited to learn a little bit more about what you do, and of course, we'll fire away with some questions when you're ready. Sounds good, thanks for having me. So now I should share my screen? Yeah, absolutely. I'll let you know if it comes through okay. How's that? All right, we got you, nice and full screen. All right, so thanks everybody for tuning in today. It's a fun opportunity to talk about um, what I do now, but really when I was sitting in your chairs a long time ago, what inspired me to study these tropical rainforests? And tropical rainforests are the most diverse uh, terrestrial, meaning on land, environment in the entire world. There are more species here than any other type of uh, environment. And as Joe said, we're talking about forests this month. And so um, <clears throat> underwater, the parallel would be coral reefs, um, also really high in biodiversity and really complex environments. Um, and what I have spent and devoted my life doing is studying these environments, trying to better understand them, for conservation, so basically for the future of our planet. Um, and I've had an incredible opportunity to travel around the world uh, to do this work. And they're beautiful environments. Um, and I'll share with you today some of my photography behind leading these different expeditions, compiling teams of scientists who are experts at what they do um, in the locations where I work, and then also get into a little bit about my tree climbing work, which is really fun and looking forward to showing you that too. Um, and so this is me doing that tree climbing work now, but this was me when I first became interested, um, really passionate at a young age, maybe, I don't know, four or five years old with my first insect net. And insects were what really drove me um, into wanting to visit a tropical rainforest for the first time, because in tropical rainforests, there are more species of insects than anywhere else in the world. And these are the monarch butterflies overwintering in Mexico. So every winter they fly south 
um, through Canada, the United States, and they hibernate basically in central Mexico. Um, and I had an opportunity to visit this site a few years ago. But I was really just overwhelmed with um, the sheer diversity of life in tropical rainforests, especially in places like Borneo, an island in Southeast Asia, where you have all sorts of animals that can glide. So this is actually a lizard that has um, a wooden membrane and they can glide through the canopy, um, similar to this silhouette of a gliding frog where they spread their toes out and um, they can glide between tree to tree. <clears throat> but I was also really interested in these, what we call like mega charismatic animals. This is a scarlet macaw um, that I just photographed a couple days ago here in Colombia. And uh, how can you not be really passionate about these animals and conserving them? Um, similarly, toucans and uh, lemurs in Madagascar. Um, this is a Javan langur. And so in Indonesia, these monkeys actually give birth to young that are a different color than them. And most of them, some of them grow up and turn black and some of them stay orange, um, it depends. And so things like this fascinated me. Um, sloths and uh, boas, chameleons. And so really when I started studying uh, butterflies when I was in college, that's when I started to travel to conduct this research. But while this image of me in a hammock in the rainforest is what I think a lot of people view what I do all the time, I'm going to show you the behind the scenes reality of some of these expeditions. Um, and so oftentimes it's uh, huge teams. In Madagascar, I was leading teams of 35 to 50 Malagasy experts to document biodiversity in this really threatened and isolated rainforest um, for its future conservation. And this was all of our food, uh, all of our equipment for that expedition. Um, oftentimes, places like Borneo, uh, you drive as far as you can on the roads, and then uh, and then the road ends at a river, and you have to take boats, um, sometimes for days or weeks, to get to your field site. Um, this was just two weeks ago in the Amazon in Ecuador, and we were um, cruising along a tributary of the Amazon River to scout out future sites for research studies with Ecuadorian biologists right along the per uh, Peruvian border. Um, but these are huge undertakings and oftentimes it requires um, a, a massive amount of personnel and um, it's not like we just show up and everything's ready to go. Uh, my role is often the logistics of coordinating these teams, sometimes years in advance, uh, applying for grants and funding to be able to go. But once we get there, we set up camp and start holding meetings. And so for me, uh, as an expedition leader, my role is not only coordinating logistics and securing funding and um, making sure everybody's safe and everybody's projects can be carried out, but then once we're there, holding continual meetings with uh, different communities and different researchers and collaborators uh, where we're working in the field, um, and then advising and overseeing all sorts of different research projects. And so here, uh, my friend and colleague Justan is identifying a chameleon that we found actually on the way out of an expedition, passing through a community, and here he has his uh, field guide of amphibians and reptiles of Madagascar. Um, and we stopped to identify the species. And then in the field is where we really get into our research. And Justin's holding the skeleton of a Parsons chameleon here, which is the largest species of chameleon in the world. And we never observed a live individual at this site, but we found a skeleton which was able, which we were able to use to indicate that this species exists in this forest. Um, is my friend Rasulu holding one of the smallest chameleons. And uh, he's a scientific illustrator and he came along to, um, I take photos and he was illustrating and drawing all the um, wildlife in a far more interesting way, I think, than what I was doing. Um, here, Lore has a 
a mouse lemur. And you can see how tiny they are by him holding them. Um, and this was a species that we weren't expecting in this area. Um, the tree in the background is called a baobab, which um, really looks like an upside down tree. The uh, branches look like roots coming out of the ground. And so a lot of this work for me um, also happens at night and high up in the canopy. So up in the canopy, you have in the tropical rainforest almost uh, all the time, you have the majority of species that you find in the tropical rainforest are above the forest floor. And so in order to see those species, in order to study them, in order to understand their biology for conservation, you need to get up into the canopy. And this was on an island called Coiba off the Pacific coast of Panama. Um, and my friend Ken took this photo with a drone. And up in the canopy there for years, uh, I was studying the pollination ecology of orchids. And so their orchids are the most diverse group of flowering plants in the world with more than 25,000 species. And many of those species, we don't actually know what pollinates them. But also with climate change and habitat conversion and degradation, many of these species are threatened or um, endangered. And so we really need to understand more about the pollination of these flowers, because after all, most of our food um, is a result of pollination. Most of the plants and fruits that you eat uh, are pollinated at some point. And so it's important to understand the ecology of this for our own species. And so these are a few different species. That last one was in Madagascar. This is back um, on Coiba in Panama. And up in the canopy, you have a totally different perspective of the world. You spend, for me, I had spent years walking along the forest floor looking up. And once I learned how to climb, it's an entirely different realm and you view things in a different way. And uh, it's incredible. It totally changed my perspective of how I view tropical rainforests, how I approach my research, and just how I view the world. Um, and just to give you a little perspective of what my perspective is, this is standing um, in an old growth cypress tree in the southeastern United States, looking down at the swamp below. So it actually looks like a blue sky below me, but that's water. So I was actually climbing in the swamp um, to study these ghost orchids, which were the focus of my research for five or six years while I was based at the Florida Museum of Natural History. Um, and this is the moth that's always been hypothesized, the pollinated, the giant sphinx moth up in uh, the canopy in South Florida. And much of this work, uh, several of these images are from my friend Max Stone, and together also with our friend Carlton Ward, a National Geographic photographer, we've been documenting um, this whole, whole entire ecosystem in South Florida together. And uh, Mac took this photo of me with a light trap. And this method is actually used to attract insects like a moth to a flame. You put out a really bright light that covers a really broad spectrum, um, broad wavelength, and a lot of insects fly in. And this is how we survey what insects are in a certain area. I don't necessarily re recommend doing it during a thunderstorm, but it made for a good image. <laughs> um, and so a lot of this work happens in the canopy and at night. This is climbing a baobab tree, similar to the one that uh, I showed in Madagascar. And this is in Mozambique, so in Southern Africa, um, photographing a friend of mine climbing at night under the Milky Way. Um, and so, a lot goes into this work, and I'm really looking forward to answering the questions that you have. Um, it's a really complex and demanding environment, and I'm going to show just one video to give you uh, a little taste of what it's like to work, especially just in the swamps of the Everglades in South Florida. In a flooded forest, when it's completely dark, you hear owls or you hear cicadas and there's a the constant hum of mosquitoes. It's indescribable, the unfathomable amount of mosquitoes. And then every so often you hear like a large animal waving through the water, which could be deer or they could be black bears. Or they could be bears. I basically wade waist deep through the swamp 
at sunset every night, I carry a stick to just like push alligators away. And for me, it's one of the most peaceful things to just be so disconnected from the outside world and you're just listening to the, the sounds of the forest. In some areas you recognize the sounds and you can identify the species. Um, in other areas that are new, you're sitting there the whole time trying to figure out what's around. And so that's a little behind the scenes. I hope I hope the audio came through on that. I we didn't run through that before, but um, just to close, another couple images from my friend Mac climbing in the cypress uh, trees of South Florida. And um, if you would like to follow along with the images that I post from all sorts of different expeditions, um, I regularly post those on Instagram and. It's just my name. It's Peter underscore, underscore Houlihan. And you can follow those images there. Um, and from this point, I think I'm going to stop uh, sharing the screen, and we're going to go to the question and answer. All right. Awesome. The audio did come through nice and clear, Peter. No worries. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. That was, that was awesome. Looking at those pictures and that little video, and I look out my office window at all the snow, and uh, I'm a little bit jealous of uh, where you are right now. <laughs> it's not bad. All right. Well, I want to give a quick, quick shout out to any classrooms on YouTube. Don't forget the chat sidebar on the right. Let us know where you're watching from and send in some questions. And in fact, I'll give a quick shout out to Mrs. Uh, Griffiths, grade nine. They're in Bel Air, Maryland, and they're tuning in live um, on YouTube. So don't forget to send us in a question or two, and we'll make sure we work uh, one of them in. Just to give that a shout out, uh, she was my one of my teachers, and that's my high school. Oh, very cool. All right. So that's a great connection. Uh, so definitely send in some questions. So let us meet our first classroom. Let's go to Canton, Michigan to start. We have some second graders hanging out with us uh, with Mr. Uh, Kozakzinski. Let me turn their microphone on. Let's see how they're doing today. Are we doing great, too? Everybody say hi. All right. All right. Well, Edel, have you really, really wanted to take a photo of, but never got the chance? That's a great question. A lot. Um, it's really difficult to take photos of wildlife in general. And for a really long time, I was a biologist first. And so I didn't carry a camera around with me. Um, and now that I'm a photographer, there are a lot of things that I've seen before that I wish I had taken photos of years ago. And I would say the animal that I wish I had a photo of the most, I saw a clouded leopard in Southeast Asia in Indonesian Borneo. Um, and it was one of the most beautiful animals I've ever seen, one of the coolest and most intimate encounters I've ever had. Um, and I wish I had a photo, but at the same time, it was one of the coolest experiences of my life. So. I have a really vivid memory of, of that encounter. All right, great question to get us started. Let us see, let's go to Mrs. Jeffrey's class, grade fours. They're hanging out with us in Bradford, Ontario, so here in Canada. Let's get their microphone turned on. How do you get your rope up to climb? That's also a great question. Um, there are three main different ways. So you can either, with every single form, you have a weight attached to a thin line that you want to throw or shoot over the branch first. And so you can either, if it's a low branch, you can throw it up. Um, but a lot of times in tropical rainforests, the trees are really high. They're 100 to 300 feet high. And so I either use a really big slingshot and so you're pulling it back and shooting this weight over the branch or a bow and arrow. And once that weight's over with the really thin line, then you tie a, a climbing rope on that's really a lot heavier and you hoist that up like you're hoisting a flag. Um, so sometimes, a lot of times, the most difficult part about tree climbing is just getting the rope in the right place and in a safe place. That was a great question. All right, awesome. Uh, let us go now to Mrs. Reading's class. They're hanging out with us in Freehold, New Jersey. 
some third graders hanging out with us. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, New Jersey? Good. Good morning. We've been learning about deforestation. Have you seen every, any forests burned down for crops? Yes. Um, and not just for crops, for all sorts of different um, uses. And so our human population is uh, growing exponentially and there's a massive demand of natural resources. Um, and many of the places that I've visited, I've returned and those, some of those forests are no longer there. Um, and it's really sad and depressing and it really um, stresses why we need to work in conservation to take better care of our planet. All right. Uh, Mrs. Saunders, fifth graders are hanging out with us in Wilmington, Delaware. Let's get their microphone turned on, see how they're doing today. There they are. Hey, Delaware, how's it going? Hi. Hi. All right, who's got a question? What was the hardest challenge for you being a rainforest explorer? I got one The hardest challenge. This is like an interview question. Um, I, okay, I would say the most helpful thing that I have worked at continually to be successful at what I do is learning languages. Um, everywhere that I work, it's critical to be able to communicate with um, my teams and everybody who I interact with. I'm oftentimes the only person who speaks English, and so I need to learn other languages. Um, and so I learned Spanish when I was in high school. I learned Swahili living in uh, Tanzania and Indonesian, Malagasy, different languages in all these different areas, but it's, um, it's because it's essential. And so I think that's a really difficult thing to incorporate, but it's one of the most important aspects. Um, and so if you really want to do this type of work, um, it's important to be able to communicate with people where, you, uh, where you're traveling and uh, with everybody who you interact with. All right, that's an awesome point. I bet most of the students would have predicted you would have said something about the gear or the weather or something, but- uh, We can talk about that, that all day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not something that people always think about is, is that language barrier and how much easier it would be to have have that skill. So something to think about, especially boys and girls, if you want to work somewhere like Latin America uh, or somewhere like that in the future studying science. All right. Um, let's go to North Palm Beach, Florida this time. Mr. LaVogue has some grade eights hanging out with us this time. Let's turn their microphone on and see how they're doing today. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Jordan, go ahead. Okay. So what's it like being a gay tester and do you get to keep the products that you test out? <laughs> that is a great question. Uh, yes, I get to keep the pro products. Um, I basically work with Patagonia to test. Uh, I work with research and development. And so when there's an idea of something that's going to come out in the future or uh, we're constantly trying to improve products. And so I mostly work on uh, gear for tropical rainforests, and that would mean waterproof bags, duffel bags, um, a lot of backpacks and stuff like that. And so I get to keep the things, but oftentimes I break most of them, not because uh, the, the idea is really to tweak out, uh, to make things as good as they can be before we sell them to the public. And so it's a really cool opportunity for me, because it's hard to find gear that holds up to the harsh conditions of tropical rainforests. And so it's nice to have input in uh, the future of what's being made. All right, very cool. Off the top of your head, can you ever think of a time a piece of gear has failed on you? Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, in like a very dangerous way, I, I could... Uh, hmm. There are probably a lot. I just I broke a few things on this trip that were just like bags and ripped straps and stuff like that. Um, for me, it's more. I think the more problematic things are like 
having issues with vehicles or boats or things like that. And the idea for the bags is if we have like a boat that sinks or falls in the rapids, um, for the waterproof bags to keep all of your gear from uh, getting wet and breaking in that sense. Um, I break cameras all the time. Uh, and yeah. Yeah. So, I, can, yeah. I can see how your work could be a little hard on your gear, especially your cameras. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we do have a question from uh, Marilyn that came in online. Um, and they're wondering, you could probably answer this in a two parter fairly easily your favorite rainforest and how you ended up. Uh, doing work for National Geographic. Great. Um, yeah, that's two parts. And people ask that all the time. I, I like to say that I um, I have a lot of long-term projects. And so it might be that I start working in an area and then I really have a strong emphasis in that country or that region for maybe uh, three or five years. And so like Indonesia, Madagascar, Panama, Cuba, those are places that I'm always going back to um, and that I've gotten to know really well. I have uh, most of my best friends in the entire world are scattered around the world from these types of experiences that we've shared together. And, um, and so it's not really just one location. Um, in a biological sense, uh, some of my favorite rainforests in the entire world are definitely Borneo. Um, and French Guiana in, in the northern part of South America. And then Nat Geo, there are many ways to get involved with National Geographic. The most straightforward way is when you start pursuing a career in science um, or exploration to apply for a grant. And so National Geographic Society provides funding for your research projects or your expeditions and by applying for a grant, if you're successful, then you're part of the geographic community. And that's how I first became involved through research for a very long time and um, now in a lot of different aspects. But that was my first segue into the National Geographic family. All right, perfect. And just to add to that, there's early career grants, which are a really good opportunity if you are just starting or working on a project or you have an idea that you can apply for a college, university, and those can be good opportunities um, to continue or get something going. Uh, let's see, let's go to Kansas this time. Seneca, Kansas, some third graders hanging out with Mrs. Becker. Let's get their microphone turned on, see how they're doing. There we go. Hello. Hi, good morning. Hi. Um, what's your favorite things that you saw in the trees so far? That's another good question. Um, I really like toucans. And so uh, I started climbing trees to study orchids, but I've, I think my favorite thing is finding nests for toucans because they live in holes inside of the tree trunk. And so when I see something like that, I'll climb a tree across from it so that I can take photos of them flying in and out of the tree. And I think that's the one of my favorite things, that and monkeys. All right, and our final live classroom, let's see, London, Ontario this time. We've got some high schoolers hanging out uh, with Mrs. Trim Pleasure. Let me make sure their microphone's on. Hello, hello, can you hear us? Hi. We can hear you, hey, hello. London. Hi. How are you doing? Hey, um, so your job does a lot of work with people and then you're in the trees and then if you come back to like a forest you love and then it's gone, like how do you deal with the stressful things like that in your job? That's a great question. Um, therapy. Um, the There are a lot of different aspects of the work that's really complicated and really difficult, um, and it's really demanding. And so those are aspects that um, you don't learn about in school. You know, like you learn how to study your species and uh, the ecology behind it and to do the methods. Um, I would actually say the National Geographic community has been the most supportive because it's a, it's a community of people that have similar experiences and are um, going through uh, 
different things together almost in parallel. And so there are different events throughout the year when we all come together and you get to kind of communicate with people who get it and who understand um, your experiences and where you're coming from. And um, that might be a roundabout kind of tangential way of answering your question. But um, I think having our community at National Geographic uh, has been a big help for me, especially in terms of um, those components of the work and the difficult sides of it. So. All right. Well, we've still got more time, so we're going to start swinging through our classrooms again. So we're going to go back to Michigan to kick us off. And second graders, if you have another question, we're ready. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Have you ever got chased by an animal before? Yes, many times. <laughs> that was not my initial reaction when it happened usually, but afterwards, sometimes it's kind of cool. Um, I can give you an example. Uh, I was living and working in Tanzania in East Africa for a while, and I would say one of the most uh, dangerous things are actually elephants. And so sometimes you'll be in a vehicle and you don't wanna turn it off because sometimes you might be next to an elephant for a really long time and then they decide to charge you. Um, and so you need to drive out of there. So um, yeah, a lot of different animal encounters, but in general, um, if you respect the distance of animals and understand their behavior and um, treat them with respect, you're you're going to be safe. So, yeah. all right, very good re reaction. Pretty excited about you being chased by animals. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see, uh, Mrs. Jeffrey's class. Your microphone is on again. Do you ever use drones to take pictures? I do. That's a great question, um, and actually something that's only become. Uh, feasible in the past few years because drones have, they're still expensive, but they're less expensive than they used to be and they're more compact. And so we use drones uh, on every single expedition that I do now. And it's to take photos. Um, sometimes I'll use them to scout out trees that I want to climb, um, to scout out areas that are difficult to access. And so um, we might fly the drone up into the sky to see what's beyond a mountain range or on the other side of a river or something like that to scout it out. And then also to just take photos and videos. So yeah, that's a great question. Technology is a uh, constantly evolving aspect of all of the work that we do for both science and exploration. All right, good question. Mrs. Becker's class, Kansas, your microphone is on again. Have you ever discovered any new species of animal that you that no one has ever seen before? Uh, that's a great question. So we have this we are describing species that have never been scientifically described before. Um, in many cases, a lot of uh, new species descriptions are species that people there are people that live there in those areas that have always known many of those things have existed and it's a matter of doing entering it into the scientific record so describing um, the ecology and the evolution of these species for the first time um, but many times uh, there are people all over the world and so um, yeah we're describing a lot of new species to science um, but it's uh, it's a complicated process and oftentimes that scientific description can take years to to actually publish so all right so mrs readings class microphone is on what is the most dangerous bug plant or animal you came across dangerous bug plant or animal is that what you said yes <sighs> there are a lot um in tropical rainforests, there are um, there are many bugs, plants, and animals that are uh, venomous or poisonous. Um, a lot of 
And, and as I said previously, if you're not handling many of these things, you're typically not at risk. Um, but in tropical rainforests, you have a lot of venomous snakes. And so I've encountered cobras. Um, in many parts of Africa, there are snakes called black mambas that are really fast and really venomous. Um, a lot of snakes all over the world are very venomous, but then also scorpions, uh, centipedes. In the rainforest where I'm at now, there are these ants that are about this big called bullet ants. Um, and that's one of the most painful things that you can experience. And so um, if you work in tropical rainforests, uh, you need to be uh, tolerant to heat and humidity and rain, but also bugs, because those are those are all over the place. But they're not out to get you. Um, they're just something to be aware of and to respect that you're sharing that space with them. All right, Mrs. Saunders, class, uh, your microphone's on again. What is the funniest thing that's ever happened to you while you were exploring the rainforest? The funniest thing. Um. Okay, uh, kind of leading from the last, well, okay, a couple with snakes in Borneo, which typically aren't uh, funny, but I had a friend who needed to go to the bathroom and she left the trail to go to the bathroom and a cobra reared up in front of her and she fell over and everybody was okay, but it was really funny in the moment or right after the moment. Um, usually things like that are funny for other people, but not necessarily funny for you. So that's, uh, that's the first one that comes to mind. <laughs> all right. I think that's always the case. In the moment, it's a little <laughs> scary. When you get out of it, then you can appreciate the humor right. of what happened. Yeah. Uh, North Palm Beach, your microphone is on again. Awesome. Go ahead, Phil. If you could go anywhere in the world to study and photograph, where would you go and why? <sighs> Right now, I would I would pick. There are always places that I return to, but there are all, there are many places that I've never been, um, and so I've never uh, visited or worked in West Africa. I've worked in Central, East, and Southern Africa and Madagascar, um, but some of the most uh, impressive rainforests in the world are in West Africa, and there are many species like pygmy hippos and chimpanzees and uh, African golden cats and all sorts of things that I would love to um, to experience. And also, when I travel as well, it's also it's an entire experience. And so I'd love to visit many of the cities um, in a lot of different countries there. So um, that's a great question. All right. And back to London, Ontario for a final question. So I was wondering that the jobs that you're doing now, was this what you wanted to be when you were a kid? Yes, but I didn't know that you could do this. Um, I, I knew, so when I was in elementary school, middle school, I was really into the, like into nature, really into animals. When I got into high school, um, I became aware that you could be a biologist um, for a living, more or less. You're not going to be rich doing it, but um, you can actually have a job being a biologist. And for me, that was a means to both work, have a job outdoors with wildlife, um, doing something that I love. And so there, in many ways, there isn't really a linear path to do a lot of these types of things now. It's um, taking on whatever experiences you can. And as you get into like college and stuff like that, taking on whatever opportunities um, you can just to get field experience and research experience and just constantly building on that. But um, as a kid, I knew that I wanted to visit a tropical rainforest at some point in my life. I didn't really know what that meant until I actually did. Um, and then it kind of became an obsession. But um, yeah, this, I think what I'm doing right now, I had actually seen a few National Geographic documentaries um, what in my like high school biology classes that featured, um, that featured women who were climbing trees. There's a documentary called Heroes on the High Frontier. And um, it was shot uh, like in the early 90s. And 
and those women were who I looked up to, and I was basically like, "They're this is awesome." I didn't know you could actually do that, and so um, one reason why, one of many reasons why representation and diversity matters so much in terms of uh, STEM fields is that like people can look up to somebody and say, "I want to be that person. I want to do that." And so, um, yeah, I could talk about that forever, but um, I am doing my dream job. For sure. <laughs> awesome. Uh, yeah, it's very lucky to have something you're passionate about. And it almost doesn't, some days it doesn't feel like work when you're doing it, when you're really passionate about it and you're you're excited about it. Uh, to finish this off, uh, our classroom in Maryland uh, has sent in a couple more questions. So I think we can put these two questions together. The first one, they're curious about the type of camera that you use. Uh, and the second one, could you estimate how many new species you've scientifically described or had a hand in describing? Yes, cameras um, for photography, I shoot uh, mostly Canon cameras. Um, I've worked with Sony cameras a little bit, um, but I have a Canon 5DS, a Canon, I, I have a ton of Canon cameras. Um, and then for film and video, um, I've been working with a few different cameras from a company called Red, uh, Red Digital Cinema. Um, and so between those two for stills and video is what I use for that type of media work. Um, the second question is easy. I currently have zero species that are new to science described. There are many that are, as I said, it's a long process oftentimes of um, making sure that it's definitely a new species and that can take years. Um, and some of them also, we just, there are a few that I discovered almost 10 years ago that are, st are still working on. So, um, and then just a couple of weeks ago, for example, uh, we were driving through Ecuador and a tarantula was running across the highway and a bunch of entomologists in the car that we were, we peeled off the side of the highway and I went and grabbed the tarantula brought it in, texted a photo to a specialist in Ecuador on tarantulas, and he said it was a new species. So things like that happen all the time, but then it means that you have a lot of work to do afterwards in terms of the description of it, so, yeah. All right, well, first of all, classrooms, thank you so much for all those awesome questions. It's always great to have classrooms joining us from all over the place. Uh, I do wanna remind you, if you took any pictures today, to post them up on Twitter, Hashtag Explore Classroom. You can tag uh, Peter, you can tag Nat Geo Education as well because we love to see those photos. A quick reminder that if you wanna check out some more of our Explore Classroom events, uh, if you go to uh, nationalgeographic.org and you look under um, education, you'll find Explore Classroom and our lineup, including on the 12th at 1 p.m. Eastern, we'll be going on a virtual field trip to Costa Rica with the Pristine Seas team. Uh, so that should be a lot of fun. And Peter, of course, a huge thank you to you. You're doing incredible work. Thank you so much for sharing it with us today and, uh, and answering the questions. It was a ton of fun. Thank you, Joe. Thanks for connecting all of us. And thank you all for tuning in and for all of your great questions. Um, and like I said, if you want to follow more of uh, this work that I'm doing, you can always check it out on Instagram. So that's an easy way to stay in the loop with what I'm up to. All right, excellent. So the last thing we'll do today, I'm going to turn all the microphones on in the classrooms, boys and girls, if you want to get nice and loud and say goodbye and thank you. Uh, uh, all right. all right. we can come in the classroom for a hearty goodbye. Thank you so much for signing off for today. <laughs>